Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ryan Cole. I'm the chair and director of the UQ Cybersecurity Research Center. Welcome to Customs House and welcome to this key milestone for UQ Cybersecurity. When I was actually walking in and I was uh, meeting up with some of my friends, they were saying congratulations and all. It all felt like a wedding banquet, you know, like <laughs> people just saying congratulations and all. Um, I think uh, I want to credit my team for, for, for this milestone and we want to also um, you know, uh, thank Corey for making the trip here to, to witness our launch as well and also do McDonald for coming here to, to introduce the masters later on. But before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which UQ operates. We pay our respects to their ancestors and the descendants and we recognize their valuable contributions to the Australian and global society. A bit of housekeeping here. Uh, the restrooms are located just over there, where Beck, uh, no, beyond where Beck is standing, <laughs> just down the corridor. And um, there is actually a uh, smoking policy here. So smoking is only permitted outside of Customs House. The smoking area is at the top of the driveway in the Riverside Terrace. Um, there are some special uh, stainless steel receptacles provided for guests to use. Evacuation procedures, so the main fire exits on the river level, which is our level, uh, the double brown doors, which are currently open. Um, interestingly, there's a fire outside, so but uh, do not be alarmed. Um, the <laughs> fire alarm is actually a constant beep. We will only evacuate at the sound of the evacuation alarm, which is a hoping sound, or at the banquet uh, manager's request. Those guys dress uh, with the tie like me, yeah. So, and uh, PA announcements will be made uh, asking guests to evacuate and managers, supervisors will assist all of you to evacuate the building. Now, I'm just going to introduce very briefly about UQ Cybersecurity. We are an interdisciplinary team and uh, we're focused on ad addressing, so our mission is to address global cybersecurity challenges and educate top UQ, uh, top cybersecurity leaders. Currently, we are a coalition of the Wheeling, a, a team of close to about 40 academics uh, coming from all faculties. Many of them are here today, actually. Uh, and practitioners from our, our universities, OSCERT uh, and ITS. Well, OSCERT was actually the world's second cybersecurity emergency response team formed in 1992. So a lot of history here at UQ after Carnegie Mellon's uh, CERT team. So our researchers uh, and our courses actually covers uh, subjects across all aspects of cybersecurity. So what we mean by interdisciplinary, we have research uh, across policy making, criminology, psychology, law, economics, management, leadership, all the way to technical subjects such as IoT, computing, cloud computing, applied cryptography and quantum technologies. So it's a very broad range, but we would like to make a very big impact on all the global challenges. Our research is also informed, interestingly, because of our um, kind of, we, have a, we are blessed to actually have OSCERT with us as well, um, where we can get feedback and data sets from the real world, the so-called real world. And through our OSCERT members and our approach also assure, assures and ensures that our students and researchers get to conduct their research and training with a strong application and impact to society. It is our goal to be the number one group in Asia Pacific within the 10 years time frame uh, since today <laughs> and to be the top program across Oceania in about five years time. So you can track uh, a bit of advertising here if you would like to visit uh, and know more about our events please visit this website with or without the dub dub dub, um, you know. So today we're going to be hearing from, um, we're gonna, there's going to be about three parts of uh, this evening's uh, activities. So first we'll be hearing from our distinguished speaker, Professor Cory Scow. And then we'll hear from uh, Mr. Tony Vizas, Director of uh, Cybersecurity Advocacy in Asia Pacific for IC Square. And then with Professor Dun McDonald, we're going to be launching Australia's first 
interdisciplinary cybersecurity master's degree. Now, speaking of IC Square, uh, this is many of you may not uh, probably know that in it was quite of uh, fortuitous because IC Square was formed about uh, thirty years ago, thirty something years ago, at a meeting chaired by Professor Corey Scow. So IC Square today is actually the world leading um, global gold standard professional certification body for our professionals in the cybersecurity uh, industry, kind of like the CPA for accountants, right? So, so this is this is great. You know, we we, we have all the key stakeholders here today in the room, um, and part of the outputs of IC Square is this certification called um, the early from from day one was this certification called CISSP. Which is now, you know, kind of a, a, a federal uh, requirement if you are applying for a USA federal uh, management job in cybersecurity, you actually need a CISSP certification. Now, who wrote the common body of knowledge for CISSP? Um, Professor Scow as well. So, you know, throughout his distinguished career, he's done a lot of things that's been pivotal to uh, our, our sector and many of the systems that we are all using right now. Um, and he has also contributed to global organizations including Microsoft when he was at Microsoft Research, General Motors and Federal Express. And he currently serves as a professor for, of information systems at Idaho State University, has been responsible for developing a distinguished body of knowledge, information security, uh, information system security over about for, used by about 250 colleges and universities in the U.S., and today, many cybersecurity professionals, including you know myself, Tony, and uh, Professor Jill Slay from La Trobe, for example, we call Professor Scow our mentor. I recall a conversation uh, a few years ago uh, in New Zealand when uh, I spoke to some of the senior members of the NSA, and several of them actually said they were actually alumni of Professor Scow. Uh, I had this goosebumps feeling then as well, you know. Uh, so. It's no surprise that uh, he's also considered to be the father of cybersecurity education, and his recent induction into the 2019 USA National Cybersecurity Hall of Fame is a fantastic testimony uh, of his impact to our society and our industry. Hence, it's with great pleasure that we have the privilege to host Professor Scow and his wife, Professor Sku Sue Scow, who's um, yep, yeah, she's. <laughs> She's there at the back, yeah. Um, let us put our hands together to welcome Professor Scout. Thank you so much. I knew I was wearing a tie for some reason. Welcome, folks. Um, I'm a fairly informal speaker on my uh, best day, in that uh, my my students all uh, are happy to see when I'm uh, getting close to the end, and uh, then I uh, take a deep breath, and they go, "Oh gosh, he's got his second wind." And <laughs> uh, so I, I sometimes have trouble picking the time to quit. So I'll have somebody shout at me. But one of the things that I, uh, I was just described as the father of what we're doing, and I, I'm not really, uh, I'm more like the midwife. You know, it was a matter of, I've, uh, I've helped a lot of things be delivered. And when I was asked to do, to accept the, uh, uh, award uh, in the Cyber Hall of Fame, I said, you know, I really haven't done very much. I feel like Dr. Johnson. All I did was keep a diary. You know, I, I've said this is what we're doing. And I, I look around the room and I see many people I recognize. Uh, I, I know that uh, Bill Cayley is here. And he and I more than, well, uh, before 2000, he and I were working together. And I came out to with the U.S. State Department to talk with uh, 
what was it called, Maui, uh, something like that. And it was saying, you know, we should be doing more things together because it, it's a matter of it's intergovernmental and my systems are no more secure than yours. And, you know, if you don't have a very secure system, I might not want to have commerce with you very much. And uh, then Nick Tate, who did some very interesting research in his doctorate, looking at the various types of certifications that people have. And he did some encyclopedic work there. And it, 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 it's sort of a pleasure to be able to work with you all. I have uh, been blessed or cursed, depending upon how I feel that day, with being given an interdisciplinary role at my university. I have been, I report only to the provost, and, and that, that is usually a good idea, but it, more importantly, I will, my, my role, my charter from the State Board of Education is to build interdisciplinary programs. So in addition to whatever we're doing with cybersecurity, I'm doing a lot with data visualization, big data, all sorts of odd things, including some things I did with uh, Eleanor, uh, Bill's wife, on identifying Maori fish hooks and their origin. And what does that have to do with it? Because cybersecurity has a lot to do with pattern recognition, those sorts of things that we, we get stuck with. Now, why are we here? This is what the, this is. This is the bait and switch we started with. Uh, uh, what, what is required in cyber education to address a skills gap? This makes an assumption that there is a skills gap. No, there is no skills gap. There is a skills chasm. It's a matter of the other side of it is barely imaginable, and it's a matter of each of us has our own perspective of that. And so with some of the things I'll talk about today, I'll be looking at that, that chasm with you. Future directions in cybersecurity education. Well, the future direction is when you're at dead stop and you're in the wrong place, move in some direction, please. And some, some of it go, goes back to Alice in Wonderland when she's said, uh, where do I go from here? She, and he says, well, do you know where you're going? And uh, she says, no. And then he says, then it doesn't matter much which way you go. You know, just, just keep moving. Well, we have to get out of that phase. We, you know, and, and it makes people nervous when academicians can't tell you where they're going. People think we should know what we're doing. Well, I know what I'm doing, but I'm not quite sure if it's the right thing all the time, but we're, we're trying to move. And so years ago, when we sort of created the foundation for ISC Square at my university, and by the way, my university is in a town of 50,000 people in a state which has a little over a million people and is equidistant from Seattle Portland, Los Angeles, um, and Denver. That tells you Cooperpedia is closer to civilization than we are. <laughs> and it, it, it's a matter, of people always say, well, why Idaho State University? Well, we were moving at the time and we attracted attention. It goes back to sort of the tie that I'm wearing that has a T-Rex on it. If you go back to the movie, they say, don't worry, if you don't move, they won't see you. Well, it turns out I've, I've learned something in, in doing what Ryan has been drafted to do, is you have to keep moving, otherwise they won't notice you at all. And you, you have, it, it, it works out. What are the roles of academic qualifications and professional certifications in the industry? Well, that's important, and uh, Nick's research brought some of that to the fore. But very importantly, it's a matter of what we're doing here has to be more than just the classroom bits. My students, I, I have a, my university was named the first center of excellence in cybersecurity in the United States. And people say, 
hold it, that, that little school in the middle of nowhere, what, what happened, what was going on at Purdue and all of these other places? They were doing things, but we were the first one who said we need to organize a bit. And it surprises everybody, and very much my wife, when I say I want to organize something. She, <laughs> I, I, am, I am the origin of chaos. And it, it's a matter of, you know, what, what are we doing there? We have to get people working and moving ahead. And part of what we do is, I have a very lucrative scholarship provided by the federal government. I can have about 20 students in it at a time. They get $35,000 a year, plus books and tuition, uh, to study cybersecurity. And the first thing I did was sort of annoyed everybody when I said, good, we'll do ours on top of an MBA. And everybody said, no, 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 this is computer science, isn't it? No, I mean it to be on top of an MBA because you have to be able to speak the native language of the people who control your destiny. And they speak accounting, and they speak finance. And the first question you'll get from them, and where's the funding from this coming? Well, you need to be able to look at their budget sheet and say, this is where the money's coming from. Oh, and that is your account, don't worry. Uh, and and so, so we do a lot with it. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the current trends. And so, this presentation got modified a great deal by talking with some students at UQ yesterday, and they, they sort of said, you know, uh, you could talk about this and you could talk about that. And I said, that's good. And I said, but I was avoiding that because I was afraid that you folks would have pitchforks and torches once I got out here and I would be, you know, the object of a lynching. And it's perhaps true because I'm going to take some fundamental questions about why this has to be interdisciplinary and move them forward. Not talking about parochial issues of what department does what. Uh, every time somebody starts talking about those parochial issues, I keep saying, no, no, we're trying to solve a problem here, not fix your budget. That's not my problem. And. Uh, it's very interesting to watch. So one of the things I'm going to look at a little bit is what do we do with standards? I am a believer in standards. And so we have systems things. And one of the things that Ryan has done is he is based his stuff on a National Institute of Standards curriculum that pulls all of these pieces together. And that's good. And we look at Tony, and he's looking at one aspect of individuals, and, and that's pretty good too. And it's just a matter of, um, there are things which you have to realize, eh, that's the right certification for this. And one of the things that academics have to be careful of is they don't fall in love with the certification to the point where they just teach the exam. If you just teach the exam, you have done nothing. Um, I went to school in, in England, and uh, pardon the term, and uh, I, uh, I took the, uh, my A-levels, and I discovered I had to write, not just bubble things in. And if you sort of start people off on the bubbling things in path, you're never sure what they really got. You know that they can repeat things that they've heard, and I've met some very intelligent cockatoos here recently. You know, the, the, and minor birds do even better. And so what we have to think about with these is, I, in my program, um, everybody who comes into the program in their first six, to eight months in the program, have to take a internationally certified exam called the SSCP. Why did I pick that? Because when I wrote the original proposal, I said I know what that one is. And then upon graduation, they're required to take the CISSP. Now most of them don't qualify to become a CISSP, but I make them take the exam. Why am I doing that? Because it is something that I can do both 
the first one I can use as sort of intermediate evaluation. And then at the end, I have cumulative evaluation. Do they at least know the words to the song? They may know, not know what it's doing, but they, they know the incantations. And then we, we look at what we do with the training. And we do something interesting, too. These students are all doing the MBA, which is a two-year program full-time. And they're doing a two-year full-time cybersecurity degree all together. Now, they are getting $35,000 a year in a state where the median income is about $35,000. And then that, that, they're not having to work 40, they're working 60 hours a week. But everything is clinical. If you stop and you think and you see programs out there that don't have a clinical component, something where people are actually doing things. And so one of the things that my students will be doing here next week, they will be starting to set up a four or five hundred core system from scratch to become a simulator to teach cyber forensics and to teach cybersecurity. And then in November, we'll have an intercollegiate competition. About 25 schools will be participating. And you think this puts a little pressure on them. It puts a great deal of pressure on them. But and they, they complain about that. And I say, well, you can resign your assistantship anytime you wish. Well, that wasn't what I meant. And I said, I was pretty sure that wasn't what you meant. But the important thing is that all of a sudden they recognize this is a, this is a discipline where you can't control the schedule that the other person is imposing on you. When the bad guy grabs something, it's your problem to figure it out. And one of the things that we... I, I met the head of school from economics here a few, few minutes ago, and I, I pointed out to him that one of the things I ask my students to do with economics is learn enough about game theory that they understand payoff matrices. And that helps a little bit with risk and some of the other things that people have to do. And so all of this is training. This is doing things. So it's not just book learning, but it's doing learning. And so when we look at computer security or cyber security, um, is it breadth or is it depth? That was the question that I was originally asked for an article that I was putting together. And I said, the answer is yes. Uh, or questions aren't very bright because they let the answerer decide what he meant and you can't do much with it. And for those of you who know the student who drew this cartoon, I'm the one on the left uh, saying breadth and the other fellow, that, that's Gene Spafford, for, uh, who I argue with continuously in a friendly fashion. But notice around behind them, there are all sorts of eyes peering in. And it's a matter of, we're really trying to look at what education is and how we do it. And it's got all of these complexities. So I've got a quiz for you. You don't need the answers, but it rhetorical questions are always good. And what, what is that? And then, hello, what's that? And that's important. Now, the real question is, what do they have in common? Anybody? This is where, yes, sir? Maybe they're both made of silicon? Both made of silicon, and they can kill you. That's the important one you ought to know. I can kill you with both of them very easily. And so the, the use of silicon here becomes an important issue. And you constantly have to look for things which, um, which one of these is not like the others. I have to be able to separate them. So here's something John Stuart Mill at his investiture at uh, St. Andrews in 1867. I commend this to you. It, it, it's talking about what education is. Education is not a lot of things. Men are men before they're lawyers or physicians or merchants or manufacturers. And if you make them capable and sensible men, they will make themselves capable, sensible lawyers or physicians or what have you. What professional men should carry away from their university is not professional knowledge in and of itself, but that which should direct their use of professional knowledge. 
that bring light to the general culture to illuminate the technicalities of their special pursuit. Think about that. You, 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 you have to start thinking about they have, the people that you're looking at need to know a little more. Men may be competent lawyers without a general education. It depends upon the general education to make them philosophic lawyers who demand and are capable of apprehending principles and intended uh, and instead of merely uh, uh, cramming their memory with details. That last piece says, please don't be a cockatoo. You know, it, it's don't don't just learn this stuff. And, and so of all other pursuits. Mechanical included. In other words, and a lot of things that happen in cybersecurity are mechanical. They are psychomotor skills. Education makes a man a more intelligent shoemaker, if that be his occupation. Not by teaching him how to make shoes. It does it by the mental exercise it gives and the habits that it impresses. He was the youngest person at St. Andrews to ever get a professorship. And this was his investiture speech. And I've always been impressed by it. And I, I, th I think that it's something that helps when I see somebody like Ryan and his colleagues building an interdisciplinary program. They're really talking about making them better shoemakers by making them better thinkers. The other piece that goes with this, and this is from Robert Heinlein, science fiction writer. And I, I, I will lead you to read most of it, but I will say, a human being should able, be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a walls, uh, set a bone, comfort the dying, and at the end it comes out, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. And that, that is sort of an interesting problem. If people get overly specialized, um, the, they become the insect of the world. And the only thing that keeps insects around is they reproduce faster than we can kill them. And it, it's a matter of last night at dinner, a colleague said, well, you know, I, I, I earned my stripes uh, learning all about all the Cisco commands. And I said, that, that, that's very useful. That also means you've learned all the Huawei commands as well. Uh, and, uh, but the underlying question I always have with this individual, I, I have no question that he knows it. But do they really know what those do? The fact that I can create the incantation that makes a Cisco switch do something in particular is charming. But do I know what the cost benefit on now? The total total cost of ownership. Do I do I know what the legal implications of using that switch to listen in on other people's stuff? Well, usually the guy who's memorized all of that. In this case, it's not true. But generally, those folks have in fact a very good knowledge of what the Cisco commands do, and not the least idea about what the implications of it uh, are. So when I look at things, I, I look at. Computer security countermeasure triad. This slide does not work well in China, I discovered, since triad has another meaning. But, uh, <laughs> and, and I did it at a, a set of meetings, and uh, Howard Schmidt, who was a colleague of mine, went up and pulled the, pulled the plug on my computer. He said, we'll revise this slide and start in a moment. <laughs> but it, it's a matter of this sort of injury, because I've got technology at the top of this. And th this is sort of the order in which people look at things. They think the technology is going to be the cure for their problem. It really isn't. Because as soon as somebody compromises a piece of technology, I've got to go buy another one. And I've got to figure out how to capitalize. Oh, I'm sorry. Those are concepts of business. Uh, magic happens and a new one turns up is the way the technologist thinks about it. But the next level of defense are um, operations, policies, and practice. Oh, I'm sorry. That's leadership. Uh, we, don't, we don't deal with that. That's another one that gets marked. Magic happens. And then this bottom one, people. Yeah, well... A lot of people who are very interested in the technology side of this view people as an annoyance and uh, that merely have problems that they have to solve. 
And so we, we work with that. So let's ask you another quiz. And I'm not sure they have, that does come up bright enough up there. What are those? What do you think they are? You see an animal up there you recognize. How about that rhinoceros? He's up there. Those are all herbivores. And this is from a cave painting done uh, near Lascaux. And all of those animals are out grazing in a field. And then there's this part of the picture. What are these? Uh, I'll give you a better version of it. There we go. What are these things? Those are all cats. And when you look at them all together, over on the left-hand side of the herbivores, and they're not paying a lot of attention, over on the right are the cats. They're your hackers. They've got to focus on what they're doing. They know what their payoff matrix is, and that's to get that rhino. He'll feed us for three days. And the rhino's going, hmm, grass is pretty good. Let's keep, keep doing it. Well, what we have to do is develop a culture. I don't need more cats. Anytime I want to have a hacker, just leave a machine unintended and unprotected on the network, and I'll have more hackers than I know what to do with. And I'll have lots of example of attacks I've never heard of. But what I want, need to do is make a smarter rhinoceros. My students don't always like that, but um, we, we work with it. Does this look like you? These are some illustrations from my book. But, gee. If you're a cybersecurity person, are you out there constantly juggling the hats? I, I, well, I'm the security officer. No, I'm the network administrator. No, I'm this. No, I'm that. And constantly juggling them around. That's not what you want. That's not a career path. That's a job. Here's another one. Again, my student who does the cartoons thought that maybe we should look at using me as the one-man band. Because it, that's not a good solution either. You know, okay, I've got one job, but I have 10,000 little ones that are part of it. And the, the line that always frightens me is when I see a job description that includes um, other duties as assigned. Uh, that, that means anything somebody else doesn't want to do is now yours. <laughs> This is another way of looking at security, particularly when an organization becomes a, a little larger. That's a four-piece combo. I've got a guy with a triangle. I've got another one with a tambourine. I've got one with a fiddle. And the poor guy with the bagpipe. Well, if you notice, they're all dressed up in tuxedos because in the meantime, they're supposed to be serving tables at your bar. And then they come together and do a set, and they go back to serving tables. That's not what you want either. Even, even if you start getting people, you want to start having them view it as something that they own and they're responsible for. In the book, I say, well, the real problem you end up with is that when you finally do get enough people, you don't want to have a group of people that are like a symphony band made up of all bass drums. Beethoven's Ninth just doesn't sound right when it's all drums. You need to have variation. And this goes back to uh, Shannon and information theory where you start talking about the concept of requisite variety. I have to have a lot of variety in what I'm looking at, which gives us the feedback to our interdisciplinary pieces because I want to have as much variation in the input. When I accept students into this very prestigious little scholarship that we have, I confuse folks. Right now, I have a student who had an undergraduate degree in photography. The only thing he knew about computers upon arrival was that's where he could fix photographs. I've got another one with a lawyer. I'm not quite sure what a lawyer does, uh, but um, he, uh, this fellow said he'd like to learn more about this. I've got another one who was a sociologist. And why do I bring these folks in instead of computer science people? Because I want to have the broadest possible set of things that they can talk about and have different views. So where does this go? Everything out there is interdependent. And it develops some hard problems for us. And we have industry, government, and academia. And this sorts of things that industry does. And notice they're all different. 
and here's what uh, government does. And the piece in the middle that brings it all together is academia, where we can deal with education and research. And that's, that's the important thing that, that you folks have done by being able to bring together this interdisciplinary program. Because it, frankly, industry and government talk very well without academia being involved. Why? Because government has money and industry knows how to get it out of them. It turns out that perhaps you need a better informed group in the middle. And of course, all academics have taken a vow of poverty, so we never get involved in the money part. But uh, clearly, we did not take a vow of, uh, of celibacy or a vow of uh, um, can't remember, uh, obedience, that's the one I always have trouble with, yes, obedience. Uh, but what we're really looking at is there's a role for us in there. And by having an interdisciplinary program, you begin to be able to meet it. So let's talk about some problems we have, and I think I'm still more or less on schedule. Um, one thing we want to avoid is the wonderful cat dog. Cat dogs are things which don't exist, but everybody will tell you he needs both of them at the same time in one body. Yes, you all ought to be able to have flexibility. And the example that I always use to talk about the cat dog, how many of you know what a systems analyst is? Most of you got a feel for a systems analyst? Yeah. It turns out that those jobs have almost disappeared. And they disappeared. Those are the people who would look at a problem and come up with the block diagram of how we were going to solve it. And then they'd turn to a programmer and say, hey, mate, get this done. And then the programmer would always complain, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, yes, I understand, but it needs to be done. What industry did to get around those arguments was they started putting them into a single job description called a programmer analyst, which means they can't solve they, they'll never come up with a solution that exceeds their ability to program. Well, in your cybersecurity area, you want to avoid creating cat dogs. You want to make it so that there is separation of thought. I missed a slide here. Well, what is this? Um, I wish I knew what that slide before it was supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> um, ah, I now remember. Let me, let me assert something. How many of you are uh, computer scientists of some, some form? Yeah. You're not going to like me. You might, you might want to pick up your, uh, your pitchforks from the back of the room. Um, or start with the torches, it creates more animation up here. But I assert that computer science does not exist. Why do I assert that? Well, I think that anything that has to put the word science in what it is probably isn't. It's it, the, the, because, you know, when you think about it, in computer science, I, and I have somebody in here who's in formal methods. I met him. I don't see him off the top of my head. But the ability to prove something gets to be important. But what computer science people do is does not meet one of the fundamental tests of being a science, which is reproducible events. And they'll tell me, oh, yes, I do. And I say, good. Last night at dinner, again, one of my colleagues as I was trying this material out, we, we, I, I said, well, when your computer freezes, gives you a blue screen, what do you do? Nick, what do you do? Get a new one. Get a new one. So, no, no, that, that's good. Uh, we'll have to refer you to the economics uh, fellow. Uh, but part of what what most people do is, and I should have given you the questions and answers before I tried to use you as a straight man. Uh, it, it turns out that, in fact, what they do is they just reboot it. Yep. And, but the real problem you have is that 
Everything I've read says that computers are finite state machines. And so if I start, restart this computer, what gives me any thought it will end up somewhere other than on the blue screen? And Microsoft proves that to me every day. But <laughs> so it really isn't. So it, it is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge, testable explanations and predictions about the universe. Computer science rarely does that unless you predict we'll get a blue screen at some point. And so let's look at the options that one has here. Hello, if I pointed at something. There we are. Mathematics. Everybody would agree that's a science, right? It doesn't have to use the word science to tell me it is one. You know, and formal methods is more on the mathematics side. Physics. Yeah, that's testable. I can get there from here. Um, folks who are graduates of the University of Australia, uh, is that where you? I thought you were ANU somewhere? St. Andrews. Pardon? St. Andrews. St. Andrews. Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it turns out, yes, uh, St. Andrews, 18, no, 1460 something was the, uh, the formation. Here's the one that I get everybody on. Political science. Hmm. Is that a real science? Probably not, but they put the word science on it so they could make you think it is. They're, they're, they're slipping one in on you here. And then we come to computer science as another example. So if you're not, if you're not convinced too much by my straw man here about computer science, let's look at this. Software engineering. Are some of you folks software engineers? Yeah, well, I won't point at you. I, I don't want to embarrass anyone. I was a real engineer first. It's okay. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, what type of train did you drive? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so when we look at this, software engineering, the example that I like to use here are um, Roman legions. All of us know Omnia, Gallia, and Trace Parsit Divisit. You know, most of us fumbled through that somewhere in our life. Well, everybody forgets Roman legions were not really military organizations. They were engineering battalions. And they went out and they built roads. Now, admittedly, they'd send the soldiers out in advance to head bash and wife steal to see if this was a good place to build a road. And they could start building a road and the, the commander of the battalion would say, well, we need to put a bridge across here. And he'd say, right, put your weapons down, pick up your shovels, we're going to build a bridge. And um, the old British song, right, says Fred, now we'll, now we'll take the knobs off. That's what they would do. They'd start building a bridge. And they, they got very good at it. They built nice straight bridges, nice arches. And they didn't have the mathematics to support doing predictive modeling of these things. And so the fellow in charge, when the bridge got, got done, he'd say, right, are you sure that that's a good sound bridge? Yes, sir, we've got that under control. And then what he'd do is he'd march everybody who had been involved in building the bridge down under the arches of the bridge and he'd run twice the rated load of the bridge across the top. This tells you that you yeah, probably ought to be able to deal with it. But that didn't last up until the 1800s. Any of you familiar with the Tay Bridge? It, uh, it crashed. And uh, anybody remember, I see you nodding your head, either you're falling asleep or you remember, uh, the, uh, the Tay Bridge. Uh, do you know what it was made of? It was iron, right? And really, not good metallurgists. pardon? Not good metallurgists. Yeah, and it, it turns out that going back to real engineering, these the concept of engine statics and engineering was not really there, and they didn't realize that if you ran bouncy trains back and forth across the bridge, the iron was not ductile, and it would particularly when it got cold, which is the Tay Bridge, it would shatter and it would fail catastrophically and unpredictably. 
And that's when engineers said, ah, we need some standards to make these things work. We need to make those go. And what we really need to be doing with the types of things your program at uh, UQ is building, you need to come up with standards that allow you to talk about the same problem to different groups of people. I need to be able to talk about the problem to metallurgists. I need to be able to talk to it about the construction, I, all of these. And so when we start looking at software problems, my colleagues frequently say, what I really want is I want to have systems that are robust. Robust systems, that, that's a good word. I, I really like those words. But in fact, the problem you have is what you really want is a system that fails gracefully. You want one that does not fail catastrophically. You want one that fails when you think it's going to fail, not when it's going to uh, just come unglued. And so you know, when you saw the Challenger go up, that failed catastrophically, and we didn't want to be able to reproduce it. So what did we do? We went back and looked at root causes. Gee, that, that's, that's sort of interesting because, in fact, some of the people who had to work on that were, psycho were psychologists. And they're the same people that are having to work on cybersecurity problems. So, so what, what, why have we been here? What we want to do is, we do want to look at the skills chasm. We do want to say, you've got to use all of these tools. And the examples, I've got probably 50 sets of these little short examples of what cybersecurity is or is not, or its parallels. I want to think about the current directions. The current directions sometimes are driven by my opponent. People, I'll get a newspaper person talking to me and say, well, what's the thing you worry about most? And it's, I worry most about finding my name in the newspaper about a catastrophic computer failure somewhere. You know, it, it's, I don't know, I'm not driving that part of my life. Role of academic qualifications? Yeah, you've got to have the academic qualifications. But you also have to have the ability to do the job. There are times when, you know, I, I my, my students are taking very high paid jobs in the U.S. government. They're required to pay off their loan which isn't a loan, it's, it's uh, slavery. But uh, it's a matter of to pay it off, what they end up having to do is they take jobs and they very quickly move up because they know how to be a leader. But in order to get the initial job, they've got to know enough about the technology and be able to put their hands on it and make it happen. Current trends and issues, Check your morning newspaper. I mean, it's a, it's a neat one, and students need to think that one through. Now, why am I here? I've been doing this for 35 years. Bill Cayley has been doing it uh, for a thousand years before that. Uh, Nick Tate uh, has been at it a while, you know. But I have to be able to think about what happens next? We had a Chickatawqua, um, a little meeting of a group of folks. It's very interesting in late December and early January, it's very easy to have things going on in Florida. And, uh, you know, we, we a group has got together, and the real question we put before the, the Chautauqua group was what have we done? Alexander Graham Bell, I think, what have we wrought? You know, we, we end up with this, this mix. Because you know what we've forgotten? It's very, been very satisfying for Bill and others to, to go ahead and create a lot of parts of this. And I, I, take, I take some credit for having written it down. I was the midwife. I watched it happen. I'm not the father. I did not have anything to do with its creation. But I wrote down what I saw. Boy, baby, eight pounds, you know. That, that's about all I was able to do. But the real question that we tried to solve was how do we 
make the next generation happen. And several years ago, four years ago, five years ago, I uh, had an opportunity to do a Fulbright in New Zealand. And a young man was my host, and he did a very, very good job of getting the local newspaper to take pictures. I loved the pictures. I'm not sure who they used as my stand-in, uh, Robert Redford perhaps, but it was, uh, it was a very, very nice picture. And I said to the photographer, but that's not the real picture you need to have. You need to have a picture that says, guys like me have to get out of the way of the young faculty who are doing this. And I can't sit there and say, well, in my day, we did it this way. You know, well, I'm sorry, we're not interested in those stun tools. I have to be able to kill you with the silicon chip, not kill you with the arrowhead. And so this was the picture we settled on. Wrong picture. That's the one that he liked. And this is the one that we ended up using. And that's Ryan sitting in the front, and he's the focus of what went on in my, uh, in my Fulbright. And I'm the gray-haired thing in the background who uh, is merely serving as the midwife. And I, I wish you all great luck and, and, and a great set of feelings about what this program is, because what UQ is doing is the first major interdisciplinary program pretty much anywhere. And what Gene Spafford did a study years and years ago where he said, um, well, we've got a problem here. He was talking to the U.S. Congress. And he said, and I'm picking a number out of the air at the moment. In the United States, there are only going to be 10 PhDs in cybersecurity created at all American universities that are not foreign students. Less than half of those are going to go to work for the federal government. The federal government has this enormous chasm. How are we going to fill it? And I got invited to chair part of the thing to figure out how to fill it. But the real problem that you have to think about with this is that that same year, according to some work done by Julie Ryan, there were over 700 doctoral or doctoral equivalent students in Australia. Now, she's been here and presented that a couple of times. and. There's a great deal of argument saying that the method was wrong. But in any case, there were more than 10. And when you look at the disparity in population, that's probably not what one would think. And when you look at China and you look at Russia and you look at others, they're another order of magnitude beyond that in people doing this. And so if we as a society, and I'm not saying as a society meaning Western, just as a society, we have to be able to control this. And we have to control it by focusing on the foreground and the future and letting guys like me stand out of the way and make it happen. So with that, I open to questions, um, observations, or it, would you put down the pitchfork, please? I'll talk to you later. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for if I've bothered you by teasing about being an engineer or teasing about being a computer scientist, it's just one way of looking at the problem. But it's the problem you have to be able to deal with.